Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Jennifer Cook. I'm the director of the Africa program here at CSIS. Uh, we're very pleased and, uh, frankly, relieved uh, to see the launch of the final version of our uh, report, Africa Policy Beyond the Bush Years, Critical uh, Choices for the Obama Administration. You can't hear me. Okay. It is on. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, this is an effort that began last April. It's been a fairly comprehensive and very participatory process to put this uh, book together. It entailed a great deal of effort, uh, first and foremost from our authors here, uh, a lot of time and focus, uh, but also from a broad swath of Africa policy experts uh, uh, here in the many of whom are here in the room. Um, first and foremost, I want to say a big thanks to our authors. Um, Joel Barkin, who did the piece on democracy, uh, retired now a senior associate uh, with CSIS. Uh, Mark Bellamy, who's the director of ACSS, now wrote an excellent chapter on uh, security engagement. Uh, David Goldwyn of da uh, Goldwyn International Strategies, uh, a, a piece on energy security. Ambassador Princeton Lyman of the CFR, um, whom probably everybody knows, a uh, chapter on trade and assistance. Uh, Phil Nyberg and Steve Morrison, uh, a, a chapter on health, um, uh, global health policy. Uh, Michelle Gavin, who I don't believe is here tonight, uh, did a very good chapter on kind of the big looming challenges, environment, demographics, and so forth. Uh, and finally, an, an excellent wrap-up summation uh, by Ambassador Chet Crocker. Um, let me say, uh, these authors put a, a lot of work uh, into this. As I said, it was a very collaborative effort. Uh, members of the working group uh, probably are too numerous to thank, uh, but they included congressional staff, corporate representatives, public health experts, advocacy, and NGO representatives. Uh, very much a bipartisan effort drawing from a, a wide swath of expertise, and we're really grateful uh, for the time and insight that, that everybody gave to this effort. Uh, in addition to the working group meetings, uh, we held a series of closed, off-the-record uh, meetings with members and former members of the Bush administration. Uh, these were tremendously valuable. Uh, people were, gave significant time to this, uh, offered very candid reflections on what the achievements of the Bush administration had been, uh, what the challenges they faced, uh, and, and some of the limitations of U.S.-Africa policy. Uh, this is well beyond the call of duty for a number of these folks and uh, considerable time, as I said, dedicated this. These included uh, uh, former Assistant Secretary Jendai Fraser and Walter Kansteiner, uh, uh, Teresa Whalen at the DOD, uh, Floriza Lazier, I'm not sure if she's here tonight, um, uh, Bobby Pittman at the NSC, Todd Moss and Phil Carter, uh, David Gordon, Tim Shortley, all at State Department, uh, Maureen Harrington and Malik Shaka, at um, the MCC, Mark Dibel at OGAC, Senator John Danforth, who uh, shared his reflections on, on the Sudan peace process, uh, our own Ambassador Johnny Carson, who at the time was a National Intelligence Officer for Africa, there's more on that later, uh, and a number of other key, key people from the administration over the years, we're, we wanted to say thank you to to those members of the Bush administration. Some of them are here, Mark Green, I think is here, Ambassador Mark Green, uh, Paul A Applegarth, uh, first director of the MCC, Mike Miller. Uh, we're, we're really delighted to see you back, and we want to thank you um, uh, for all your engagement over the, over the last eight years. Uh, the result of this big effort, I think, is a very balanced, comprehensive report, uh, and we hope it will help the new administration to build on the achievements of the Bush administration, uh, harness the growing constituencies uh, who are interested in and concerned about Africa, uh, and build a smart power approach uh, that is anchored by sustained, robust diplomatic engagement. Um, early, earlier versions of the report were uh, released to the transition team. There have been chapters up online, so I'm not going to go into great detail. Uh, you have the books, I think, most of you. I'm not going to go into great deal, detail on the uh, conclusions, but just a few themes uh, that I'd like to pinpoint. Um, U.S. engagement in Africa, obviously, over the last eight years, has grown much more expansive and much more complex. Uh, it's driven by mounting recognition of U.S. strategic stakes in Africa, new, new constituencies here, bipartisan support in Africa, and importantly, I think the leadership of President Bush. 
uh, new resources, new institutions, uh, PEPFAR raised the bar in, in many ways on, on uh, 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 development assistance. The MCC, a really innovative model. Uh, AFRICOM that pulls together kind of the disparate span, uh, strands of mill-mill engagement. Um, all of these were new. Um, the new administration, I think, has an opportunity to build on these achievements and I think has the challenge of ensuring that expanded U.S. engagement is appropriately balanced across these various areas. Uh, this means HIV versus other health challenges, health versus broader development challenges, uh, humanitarian programs versus programs that invest in trade and investment capacity, uh, military versus non-military security, uh, balancing short-term tactics and crisis management against longer-term uh, ambitions and opportunities. So. Managing this complexity and getting the balance right requires several things from U.S. policy, three things, I'd say. Uh, first and foremost, it requires robust, capable diplomatic engagement. Uh, you can't do this with an understaffed Africa Bureau, uh, with a development agency that is, appears somewhat adrift, and with embassies operating uh, with serious deficits in personnel. Second, it means strengthening multilateral diplomacy, coordinating better with the United Nations, the African Union, European partners, uh, the so-called new players in Africa, China, India, uh, some of the Asian players, and these are on, on issues that concern us all on peacekeeping, crisis diplomacy, transnational threats, and development challenges. Uh, finally, it requires strong, capable, and accountable African partners. I think a reprioritization of the democracy and governance agenda is vital. Governance is at the core of every U.S. interest in Africa. Uh, and it's most difficult but most important in those countries in which we have important security or strategic stakes, whether they be energy, conflict, or, or counterterrorism concerns. Uh, I think one of the pleasures of working on Africa policy is that it's not victim to deep partisan divides. I think the greater division is between those who recognize that Africa warrants sustained, coherent engagement and those who are not quite there yet. Um, I want to say one thing before turning to Steve. Um, I want to say a very special thanks to our program coordinator, David Hennick. Uh, anyone who's worked with our program after the last, over the last two years knows what an incredibly efficient, uh, thoughtful, and hardworking professional he is. Uh, he's been a tremendous asset to the program and to this particular effort, substantively, logistically, and so forth. Uh, he's leaving for law school at the end of this uh, summer, and so we're all bereft. But uh, thank you, David, for everything you've done for this. I'll turn over to Steve Morris. Thank you, Jennifer, and uh, good evening. Um, I'm Steve Morris, and uh, I had the pleasure of working with Jennifer and pulling this project together, and I want to single her out for the extraordinary effort that she put into uh, particularly in, 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 in editing these chapters into what I think is a very, very nice core. Um, I, I think that Africa is special as a, as a, as a, as a, as a zone of U.S. policy. Um, it's one that uh, we can have a special pride in. And many of you in this room, including many of the civil servants and, and, and foreign service officers, uh, should be especially proud because um, uh, there's such enormous continuity and commitment in this room towards Africa policy. And as Jennifer has said, it's something that crosses many divides uh, and unites us. Uh, it has this special aspect, and that's part of what I think has attributed to the remarkable achievements of the last several years and the prospects that we're going to see more looking forward. Um, we did enjoy a very generous reception uh, from the Bush team. Uh, Jen Dye Fraser, Walter Kansteiner, Bobby Pittman, Todd Moss, the list goes on, gave very generously of their time and their thought, thoughtfulness uh, in looking, at, in, in recounting and reflecting uh, what they had experienced and commenting on some of the, uh, some of the drafts that we presented. Um, we also called upon uh, many other people who are here, like Mark uh, Green, uh, Mike Miller, uh, and, 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 and others, uh, to help us. Um, I, wanted, I have the pleasure here today of introducing uh, Johnny Carson, our new Assistant Secretary for African Affairs at the Department of State. Um, he's entering uh, a pretty uh, amazing moment, really. It's one in which uh, there's high expectations and hope 
uh, for the Obama administration. Uh, the Obama administration's already gotten out of the box in certain, in certain very important respects, the President going to Ghana in July, the Secretary of State going to Kenya in August, a new global health initiative, a, a, a food security initiative, an evolving food, uh, an evolving education initiative, all of which are going to impact, all of these are going to come together. Uh, the fact that we had Morgan Shabon Garai here uh, this week, a very telling, very significant uh, indicator as well. Johnny has agreed to come and speak for, for, for 10 minutes or so uh, around uh, his, sharing his thoughts on, on, on looking forward. Uh, in this period on Africa policy and has kindly agreed also to take a few questions from you uh, at, at, at the close of that. Um, he um, uh, is among the most distinguished uh, American diplomats. Uh, he's known to, I'm sure, everyone in this room. Uh, he, his, his era of service goes back several decades. I first met him in 1987. Shortly after he had been working uh, with my then boss, Howard Wolpe, who's with us today. Howard, in his role as chair of the House Subcommittee on Africa, Johnny had provided integral input at a very delicate moment in the early 80s and then had gone on to Botswana as, as the DCM in that late 80s period. And what was clear then and still clear today is, is that this is a man of boundless energy and passion about Africa and thoughtfulness. He's a very passionate and considerate individual and has, has remarkable leadership capacity that we've seen through the years in his role as ambassador to Kenya, to Zimbabwe, as a principal deputy assistant secretary in the late 90s, which was a very turbulent and trying period. We don't need to go into all of the different uh, shocks that we experienced in this period, but uh, Johnny was very much at the helm in that period of the, of the embassy bombings, of the Congo War, uh, some of the one of the darkest and most stressful periods in which uh, I believe our approaches actually hung together to a significant degree because of his determination and commitment in that period. In the last several years, he patiently uh, took on the duties of being the national intelligence officer and fulfilled that role brilliantly. And um, and and to the Obama administration, the Obama campaign, and the Obama administration's credit. They recognized his brilliance and commitment early on and began to rely on him. And, and this is one of those great success stories in which his passage through Congress to this moment happened uh, without any uh, interruptions or uh, the, uh, terrible setbacks. So we can welcome him to his post today. So please join me in doing that. Thanks very much, uh, Steve. I don't know if people can, can hear me or not uh, out there, but uh, what a kind and, and thoughtful introduction. First of all, let me can, uh, say how pleased I am to be here at CSIS this evening with all of you uh, as you uh, uh, participate in this uh, book launch. Uh, to Jennifer and Steve, uh, you've done a marvelous job here at CSIS. Uh, serving uh, as the conscience and think tank for much of the thinking that has gone on with respect to, uh, to Africa policy uh, over the last uh, eight years. Uh, it is greatly appreciated, uh, and it is also reflected in the quality of the, of the book. Uh, it's a, a little daunting sometimes to be standing up here and talking to this audience, and I see so many faces and friends out there you've already mentioned. Uh, Howard and Reed Kramer and others that I've known for many years, but even to be uh, up here next to this panel, and as I look down from Joel Barkin to David to Princeton Lyman and, and David and, uh, and Mark and, and, and probably the doyan of this group, uh, Chet Crocker, uh, there's probably uh, no less than uh, probably 200, 225 years worth of African. <laughs> <laughs> worth of worth of uh, collective uh, collective uh, African knowledge here at this uh, at this table, uh, and and that uh, is reflected in the quality of the of the book th that has been uh, produced uh, from front to back. Uh, when I agreed to come this evening, I 
told Steve that I would not, in fact, uh, come with any prepared uh, remarks and basically uh, say just a, a few things. Um, and it's certainly not a, a time for me to uh, have any retrospective uh, comments or critiques uh, of the past uh, administration. I will say uh, one thing I think that Chet put in uh, his book uh, chapter, and it said, uh, you know, build off of the past, uh, don't tear it down, uh, look uh, uh, before you jump in, uh, and uh, build, on what's, uh, build on what's good. Uh, the past administration uh, did leave uh, uh, three important marks, and I think uh, Jennifer referred to several of them, but let me underscore uh, that PEPFAR uh, stands out as an extraordinary uh, political and health initiative. Uh, it put us in the forefront of dealing with Africa's most important global health crisis, HIV-AIDS. Uh, it is up to any new administration uh, to build on that, not to let it flag, because health care uh, remains uh, an important uh, issue uh, throughout the African continent. Uh, second, I think that uh, MCC uh, is critical and important uh, as well. Uh, it's a new way of putting development assistance money into the hands of uh, important and needy African states. Uh, we need to uh, look at that, uh, support it, uh, and build upon it. I will put an asterisk here and say that the creation of MCC should not be used uh, as a, an excuse to uh, eliminate uh, USAID. Uh, both uh, serve a very important uh, purpose and fill important development gap niches around the continent. Uh, there is a need for an MCC, uh, but in my opinion, there's also a need for a good old-fashioned USAID. Uh, and I hope that uh, both will continue. I think that the other uh, important uh, aspect is, is AFRICOM as well. Uh, it is uh, an important new element, uh, and it's not going to uh, go away, uh, but must, in fact, be used uh, effectively uh, as a part of, as a part of U.S. foreign policy not the lead role uh, in U.S. foreign policy. It is a element, uh, an element of what we uh, do on the continent. Uh, that's a little bit of looking uh, back, but let me look uh, ahead just uh, a, a little bit. Uh, some things uh, uh, need to be done and are starting to be uh, done. Uh, one is engagement uh, by the new administration. Uh, the uh, president uh, is engaged, involved, and I think uh, Michelle Gavin uh, was intending to come. I spoke to her a couple of hours ago, but she's actually a, lo a lot busier than I am sometimes. Hey, Michelle, are you here? Hey, yeah, she, <laughs> she said she was coming. <laughs> um, but uh, Michelle can also testify that the administration uh, is engaged just in the last uh, several weeks. Uh, and including this week, uh, today, for example, uh, to give you a, uh, an indication of what the Secretary is doing. Uh, two hours ago, uh, she met with the uh, Senegalese uh, Foreign Minister, Gaggio, for about 35 or 40 minutes. Uh, talked to him uh, at length about his efforts uh, ongoing to resolve the problems of uh, return uh, to democracy uh, that we're wishing and hoping for uh, in Mauritania. Uh, she also uh, discussed with him uh, a number of, uh, of other issues about regional uh, concerns and also about uh, Senegal's effort uh, to get an MCC uh, compact. Democracy was also uh, on the table. But earlier uh, in the day, uh, she uh, spent uh, a good 35, uh, 40 minutes uh, with uh, Morgan Changarai, uh, who will be meeting uh, tomorrow uh, at the White House uh, with uh, President Obama. Again, a wide-ranging uh, discussion. But these are not just one-off uh, occasions. Uh, in the last uh, several weeks, probably under the radar, uh, it shouldn't be, uh, but it mostly is, 
uh, there has been the first meeting uh, by the president with uh, head of African head of state. Uh, president Kikwete was here. Secretary met with uh, President Kikwete. Uh, she's met uh, with uh, former uh, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan uh, to discuss uh, issues related to uh, to Zimbabwe, uh, to Sudan, uh, and also uh, Kenya, where he played a very important role. She's met with the Angolan uh, uh, foreign minister uh, and had very uh, good talks. Uh, and she has called uh, a number of other counterparts uh, in Africa. Uh, there is, in fact, uh, a lot of movement. Uh, Steve uh, uh, mentioned that uh, the visits that are coming up, uh, mentioned that uh, the president is going out to Ghana, the first time uh, that we have seen a American president uh, engage so early uh, in an overseas visit uh, to uh, a African country. And hopefully these kinds of visits uh, will become more routine. Uh, it does not have to be the annual grand tour. Uh, it can be a visit uh, like the one uh, going into Russia, one off visit a country going to or from someplace else. Uh, it should be uh, integrated as a part of what we do. I think Chet, in his chapter, said that uh, uh, Africa policy should be mainstreamed. Uh, it should be a part of our daily thinking, not just the preserve of simply thinking uh, it is the responsibility of the Africa Bureau. But the other bureaus ought to also be concerned about our African issues as they talk to diplomats in Latin America, the Middle East, and Europe. Uh, but we uh, do see the president going, and he's setting up uh, the, the agenda. But we will see the, uh, the secretary travel to uh, AGOA uh, first week in, in August. Uh, and she has committed herself to making uh, several uh, other stops as well. I won't say uh, where they are at this point, uh, but she is committed to doing so. But even beyond that, uh, if the secretary is getting out early, uh, the Deputy Secretary of State uh, probably will get to the continent before uh, either of those uh, two uh, uh, senior level visitors. So we not only have a visit by uh, the President, uh, the Secretary, but we've also got a trip uh, teed up uh, with countries identified uh, with the Deputy Secretary traveling uh, to, the, uh, to the continent. Diplomatic engagement also extends to the fact of uh, Special Envoy Scott Gratian. Uh, getting uh, out of the blocks quite rapidly, several, three trips already uh, out and around the region working uh, on uh, the uh, Sudan uh, policy. Uh, there is energy, uh, there is dynamism, uh, and it's not just travel. Uh, there, uh, if, you, if there are any African diplomats uh, in the audience, uh, they will know that yesterday uh, they were convoked uh, to uh, the State Department uh, to get uh, the first indication of what uh, will be, uh, we hope, uh, one of the administration's signature initiatives on food security. An extensive briefing uh, held uh, over a two-hour period to talk about where the administration wants to go in dealing with the issue of food security uh, and agriculture and agribusiness. Uh, some of you probably heard me uh, talk probably too much about this, uh, but of course uh, I believe uh, this is one of the lacuna, uh, not just from the past administration, uh, but from many administrations uh, some time back. Uh, agriculture uh, is important. Uh, some 70 percent of all African households depend either as a primary uh, or a secondary uh, source of income uh, on agriculture. Uh, some 40 percent of the GDP of every African country uh, is uh, based on uh, agriculture. It is a thing that employs uh, today, as it has uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, the most uh, Africans around, uh, and many women uh, as well. But the Green Revolution that helped to transform uh, Asia uh, and Latin America uh, has not yet come uh, to Africa. And if Africa is going to make progress, it has to deal with the whole spectrum. At the bottom, uh, we have to reduce poverty. 
by increasing agricultural production. And we have to use agricultural production as a way uh, of generating uh, greater export earnings uh, and greater uh, business uh, enterprise. It's very important. Uh, and I think that uh, the initiative that the administration is working on uh, will roll out more formally uh, in the uh, days and weeks ahead will be one of those uh, important new uh, areas. I think there's also a strong commitment uh, to dealing with issues of uh, energy uh, and environment on the part of the administration. Uh, that is a global issue. Uh, there are winners and losers in the environmental uh, situation uh, that prevails around the world, uh, and Africa uh, is ill-prepared uh, to deal with some of the environmental uh, problems uh, that uh, confront us all. Uh, and I think uh, initiatives in that area uh, may also be uh, forthcoming. And thirdly, uh, one thing uh, that uh, there will be certainly a great deal of stress on uh, is uh, the issue of conflict uh, and uh, uh, conflict uh, prevention, uh, conflict mitigation, uh, very important uh, issues. There's no doubt that while conflict around the continent has decreased rather substantially in a number of areas, uh, we see uh, in several uh, parts of the uh, continent uh, persistence of, of conflict. Conflict in the eastern uh, Congo, uh, conflict uh, in uh, Somalia, uh, conflict uh, in, uh, in, in Darfur. Uh, these uh, conflicts uh, undermine uh, the ability uh, of states to do the things uh, that uh, states are supposed to do, and that is provide security and opportunity uh, for all of their uh, citizens. But we find that conflicts are, are pernicious, uh, and they generally uh, are largely things that can spread across border and generate uh, real problems. I think you'll see a commitment uh, to uh, the admin by the administration to try to uh, uh, do early prevention, uh, to get in, uh, try to stop them uh, before they occur, uh, if they occur, to mitigate them, uh, and if they uh, do happen, come in uh, and support them uh, or support the resolution uh, in an uh, equitable fashion of what's out there. Uh, one of the uh, early uh, signs of this, I think, is a visit that both uh, Michelle and I made uh, 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 shortly after I was sworn in. Uh, I took off uh, immediately uh, for uh, Africa. Uh, second stop was Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Michelle joined me uh, out in uh, Nairobi carrying a special message from the, from the President. Uh, we went and we met with all of the senior officials, uh, all parties, uh, civil society, cross basis of uh, folks, and expressed uh, our concern uh, about the uh, problems that we saw uh, that remained unresolved uh, since the uh, of flawed elections uh, and the violence uh, that occurred in January and February of 2008. Uh, we did it because uh, we could see uh, things sliding down. Uh, they had not yet reached crisis point, and they had not moved from crisis uh, to political violence uh, and instability. But the only way, the only way that you can prevent the worst things from happening is by getting in early. I think we will continue to do that. I think the efforts of Scott Gration on, on, on Sudan are, are illustrative. Uh, I know myself that I've been uh, very, very seized and, and involved in, in, uh, in Mauritania. Uh, uh, Foreign Minister Gadio's visit here uh, today from Senegal uh, is an extension of the work uh, certainly that I've been doing and others in the department over the uh, last three or four weeks uh, trying to help uh, him resolve that situation. I certainly have been on the phone to uh, most of the senior leadership uh, in Mauritania, uh, including some that I will not name, but we uh, hope that, uh, that our actions will, will help in, in, this, uh, in this regard. And certainly uh, on the issue uh, of, of uh, Somalia, which is of major concern to us, uh, uh, I have uh, certainly been active out there. 
Let me conclude by uh, doing uh, quickly uh, two final quick notes, and then I'll stop, Steve. Uh, you know, people ask, what are we going to focus on? Some of it is, uh, a lot of it is, uh, is, is, is a little bit of the same uh, things that you've heard before, but they remain important. Uh, strong effort at promoting uh, democracy, rule of law, and good governance. Got to be critical, absolutely critical. Second is crisis uh, prevention. Uh, as I said, doing as much as we possibly can to uh, prevent uh, and uh, mitigate and resolve uh, conflicts. Third one will clearly be an effort to uh, focus on uh, strengthening uh, economic development and fighting poverty uh, throughout Africa. And a fourth issue, clearly uh, out there helping uh, Africa deal with a whole host of transnational uh, issues uh, that uh, uh, the continent uh, faces, uh, new ones and old ones. Uh, uh, some of the new ones clearly are climate change. Some of the new ones are uh, the spread, uh, the rapid spread uh, of uh, narco-trafficking. Uh, we have a situation today in, in Guinea-Bissau, uh, people were saying that it probably was first uh, Africa's first narco-trafficking state. If you've been watching the news, we've seen a president, uh, an army chief of staff, uh, and just this past weekend, two uh, senior uh, former government ministers, including a presidential candidate, uh, all gunned down. It is possible, and I'll make the, the statement that it is possible that in the next uh, several years, uh, Guinea-Bissau uh, uh, could easily become uh, the uh, West African version of, of Somalia. Uh, it is a situation uh, where drugs uh, and drug trafficking have become a major problem. But it's not just there, uh, it's all up and down the, the West African coast, and in fact drugs are increasingly a problem. Uh, in places like uh, East Africa uh, and uh, also South Africa, and one can get into uh, that in some, some uh, detail. But these are the kinds of transnational issues that, uh, that have to be uh, dealt with because they will serve as a cancer uh, and eat away uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, uh, at, at African society. Uh, one of the things that is also very, very important moving beyond the transnational issues, uh, as we deal with issues related to Africa, we must, we must, we must, we must not forget uh, that Africa has enormous, and I stress that, enormous untapped potential. Uh, while we are dealing with some of the small brush fires that are out there, we have to carve out time an effort and energy to plant trees uh, to help Africa achieve uh, its uh, enormous potential. And we've got to make sure uh, that we don't uh, only deal with the, the, the negative parts. We've got to in, be uh, active and supportive of all the good things, of all the good things that uh, are happening on the continent. And we have to do it all over the continent and, 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 and stress that as a, as a, major, as a major factor. Good things are happening. Uh, we've got to find them, endorse them, support them, uh, and promote them. And uh, I'm going to stop, and that's my uh, quick spiel. Uh, we're running a little behind schedule. I apologize for that. We'll run our panel, our roundtable, which follows immediately till about seven. Let's take one round of questions yeah, here. Just three, three questions um, right here. Uh, we have microphones. John, and right here, this gentleman here, and this gentleman here. So, uh, go right ahead. Who's first? Hello, um, Ambassador Cochran. I'm David Schifferon. I'm right now working with the Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, I just. Okay, I'm just wondering. You know, I heard that uh, just recently. I read that um, uh, Kofi Annan plans to 
meet with uh, the Kenyan government to try to pressure them uh, to become more forthright with instituting the uh, necessary uh, uh, accountability in the post uh, that, that they had um, agreed to in the post-election environment. And he said if not, he was prepared to forward names to, uh, to the uh, International Criminal Court. And already you have uh, Bashir who has, um, uh, you know, gotten an indictment on that. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, whether these instances might uh, sidetrack uh, the U.S. policy from dealing with, uh, you know, the major, uh, you know, governance issues, uh, you know, development issues, health issues, crisis issues, whether this, whether this new attempt of trying to indict political leaders in Africa might result in some uh, sidetracking on the part of uh, U.S. policy on what really counts, in other words, and on what really matters to the, pub the public at large. I can answer that one quickly. No, it will not sidetrack us. <laughs> 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 and I think that, uh, uh, that those individuals who uh, do things uh, illegally uh, should, in, fa in fact, face uh, justice and prosecution for them. Mr. Carson, thank you for your comments. I wanted to ask you, I applaud that you focus on agriculture, <clears throat> but I want to push you a bit further uh, in terms of land tenure issues. Countries I know best in the Eastern Horn and even in Ghana, land tenure issues are a total mess. Uh, and the core of local politics, and I don't understand how democracies can survive uh, with that ticking time bomb. So I hope that you or your administration will focus on those issues. John, good point. Well taken, and certainly we'll we'll pass it back. Thank you. Hi, Dylan Osmond from the Voice of America Somali Service. Uh, Ambassador, I just wanted to ask you, uh, you went to the um, IGC um, Italy meeting recently in Somalia, so I wanted to ask what, what, what was the uh, resolutions that have come out of that, and also Italy has decided to open up its embassy in Somalia. Is the U.S. going to follow suit? Uh, I did not go to the meeting. My deputy, Phil Carter, went to the uh, meeting and were active participants. A number of countries pledged uh, money uh, to support uh, development initiatives in Somalia uh, whenever uh, those initiatives uh, uh, can get off the ground. Uh, currently, it's difficult, as you realize, to uh, do things like that. We continue to uh, support uh, the Djibouti process. Uh, we support the government of Sheikh Sharif. Uh, we encourage uh, EGAD countries to support them, uh, and we're encouraging uh, those countries uh, who have a, uh, a way of preventing uh, assistance from going into the Al-Shabaab to do so. Uh, but uh, we think that uh, Somalia is at a critical uh, stage. Uh, the government uh, of uh, President Sharif uh, needs all the assistance uh, that, it, uh, that it can receive. And I'm going to stop because I'm interrupting the program. Are we on? Yeah, we're on. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot to talk about. The book actually covers a great deal of ground. I am not going to uh, attempt to introduce the speakers because their bios are there. So what I will do, <coughs> my name is Chet Crocker, and I'm a part of the book, but I just did a few things at the very end. These are the guys and others who are here and, and gals who wrote in this book and made it uh, the book that it is. We have two basic questions to kick around, and I'm going to ask our panel to spend about five minutes on the first question, each five minutes each, and then we have a second question. The first question is one that Johnny touched upon, which has to do, and Jennifer and I kicked these questions around a bit over the past few days, and I hope the panelists all got them, but the first set of questions is, how do we keep Africa on the radar, given what's going on in the world today, given the legacy that President Obama has inherited? It's an easy question. That one we, we know you'll... you'll you'll have no trouble with. How do we keep Africa on the radar? How does it fit 
Um, related to that, what new initiatives are possible? And Johnny's already answered this question in part, but what, what new initiatives are possible given the crowded foreign policy agenda that we have? And then the third related part of that question is <clears throat> how do we avoid just playing defense? How do we actually have initiatives and not just react, not just react to, to things that come along? Uh, and deadlines that are set, for example, an election that's taking place. So how do, we, how do we actually take initiatives and not just be waiting for things to happen? So that's the first set of, of issues. The second question is one that's, I think, in the minds of many people as they look at Africa right now. When this book was conceptualized, it was fair to say that Africa was uh, a much more competitive playing field than it had been historically, a much more active zone of engagement and competition by various uh, uh, leaders around the world, various countries, uh, various economies, various companies. We now have a global financial and economic crisis. How is that impacting things? How is that impacting the competitive playing field that Africa represents from the standpoint of American policy? So I'm not going to say anything more. I'm going to try and, and, and play traffic cop here. And let me just give you the order of, of speakers who will address these questions. And if there's any time left after the wine, if the wine holds up, we'll go on. Um, but I'm going to first ask Dave Shin if he would say a few words, and then I'm going to go to Mark Bellamy, and then to Joel Barkin, and then to Dave Gord David Goldwyn, and then to Princeton Lyman to play cleanup. Dave. Thank you very much, Chad. Uh, I'm just going to, to try to take a couple of, of discrete elements of that question because there's so much expertise at the table here. First, and I'm not going to start with the, with the first part of the first question, I want to start with a new initiative and one that has not uh, yet been mentioned by Johnny. I think all of the initiatives that he outlined are, are excellent ones. But there's another one out there that I think has been very frustrating over the years. Uh, I spent 37 years in the Foreign Service. I saw various administrations try to tackle it. Uh, none of them really su succeeded at it, in my view, but I think it deserves another effort, and that is, how do you engage the American private sector in Africa, particularly in investing in Africa? Uh, now, this is perhaps the most miserable time in the world to talk about investing in Africa in, in one sense, and that the fact that so many American companies are, have their own difficulties now. But the fact is that Africa is doing relatively better than North America or Europe is doing at the moment. And there are a lot of opportunities out there. The banking system is sound. They didn't do all of these silly things that American banks did. Uh, this is actually a good time to be thinking about investing in Africa. But for whatever reason, it has always been hard, irrespective of the administration, Democratic or Republican, to somehow get a critical mass together that can really energize the U.S. private sector. And it is private, and that means it will make up its own mind as to whether it's going to engage or not. But I think there are ways in which the administration uh, can uh, try to energize the private sector to do more than it has done in certainly the last couple of decades, because it's been a, a pretty spotty performance uh, in the last several decades. That's point number one. Point number two that I want to talk about, and, and I will stop. Um, the issue that uh, Chet raised about how do you get ahead of the problem uh, rather than just reacting to, uh, to difficulties in Africa, and that has been the tendency, certainly in my 37 years in the Foreign Service, we're, we're mainly reacting. Uh, not too many examples of where I can identify uh, areas where we tried to get ahead of it. Chet perhaps was at the head of one of those principal efforts in dealing with the, the issue of um, of Namibia and Angola and South Africa and coming up with a, a really constructive um, end result. But the number of times that happened in the last 37 years, you can probably count on a couple of hands. There's, there's one effort that I, I think merits going back and looking at and trying to draw lessons from, even though it really didn't succeed. Uh, it was an effort that was designed to do exactly this to get ahead of the problem. It's called the Greater Horn of Africa Initiative, uh, long since been forgotten came out of the Clinton administration was an effort to uh, deal with two essential problems in what we call the Greater Horn. The Greater Horn included uh, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, and um, uh, the, the five main countries of the Horn. It was to do two things by the time we finally boiled it down. One was to start uh, getting a, a better handle on, the, on preventing conflict in that region where there was an enormous amount of conflict and two, doing a better job of mitigating the existing conflict. 
The other principal element was focusing on food security so that the countries of these 10 countries uh, would not be in the position of having to import more and more food just to keep their people alive. It was a very well-intentioned policy. It, it failed for a whole bunch of reasons, not the least of which is that new conflicts tended to, to steamroll whatever efforts were being made to deal with them. Uh, maybe this is, uh, is too ambitious. Maybe, um, maybe one needs to, to prune it back a bit, uh, this kind of a concept. But I think there's a lot to be learned from this uh, effort to, to deal with the Greater Horn of Africa uh, from the standpoint of getting ahead of the curve rather than simply reacting, and I hope that the new administration will go back and, and learn some of those lessons. Um, how do you keep Africa, uh, or how do we ensure that Africa stays on the radar screen uh, this year, next year, uh, for, the, for this administration? And I'm not sure that's, that's, that's going to be all, altogether easy. Uh, when I think back f over my generation, I can think of, of two ways in which Africa has remained reliably on our radar screen. And one is as a, as a theater uh, in, of competition with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Uh, the Cold War um, uh, uh, told us where Africa's place was in the constellation of our foreign policy concerns. It imposed a certain set of priorities for better or for worse. Um, and, and the other case is, is post 9-11. Uh, post 9-11, Africa became uh, battle space or prospective battle space, if not in a kinetic sense, at least in the sense that we felt that we needed to compete to, um, to um, defuse extremism, uh, to combat radicalism, to, to win hearts and minds. In fact, I think much of the surge in assistance that we've seen in Africa over the past eight years has to do uh, with that competition in Africa. Uh, but those, the, 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 the logic imposed by those two situations is, is, is probably no longer applicable. Uh, and in the absence of those two compelling um, uh, situations, I'm not sure what, uh, uh, how, we, um, uh, how we can assure that Africa retains uh, the attention of policymakers and commands the resources it needs. Um, I made a few notes before coming here, and I was interested uh, to, to see, um, to hear uh, Johnny mention food security. Uh, food security is top of my list. Um, if there are two issues I think that, that will be particularly salient uh, in the next, in the next, uh, in, the, in the short term. Food security and, uh, and the impact of, of climate change on African populations are likely to be the two. Um, if, you, if you consider that these are vulnerable governments for the most part, fragile governments uh, that are dealing with or trying to deal with persistent underdevelopment and questions of poverty and disease and institutional weaknesses and so forth, and you add food insecurity and the enormously disruptive effects on already marginalized populations of, of climate change, uh, I think you, you can envision a situation where, where, where these governments uh, could be seriously des destabilized. And so initiatives to address those two specific issues, I think, are, are, would, certainly be, would certainly have some chance of ensuring that Africa got the attention it deserved. Uh, one other, just one other point before I conclude. I, I was interested in the idea of mainstreaming uh, Africa. Um, you know, I think that, um, uh, mainstreaming um, is not only a question of making sure that Africa is on the agenda when we talk to the governments, uh, but it's also ensuring that we talk to Africa about the rest of the world. Um, if there's going to be a new, uh, uh, um, um, uh, if, there, if there's going to be if there's going to be global agreement on what to do about climate change, uh, if we're going to sustain and extend uh, the idea of promoting democracy, promoting the rule of law, promoting better governance worldwide, if we're going to have a new uh, world trade agreement. Africa is going to have a role in that. Africa is going to have 50 voices, and increasingly Africans are trying to operate uh, and speak with a single voice. Chinese are certainly aware of this. Uh, others are certainly aware of this. Uh, our tendency, uh, unfortunately, in the past has been to wait until we've got an important vote coming up in the Security Council, send, a, send, a, send instructions to embassies to go find somebody in the foreign ministry to march with a set of talking points that neither side really fully understands. You know, <laughs> we, you know, probably would do well to consider how are we going to engage African governments on these global issues where they are going to, they are increasingly going to speak and, 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 and have a voice uh, that, uh, that is important. And I think that might be uh, a worthwhile project for a new administration. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wrote the uh, chapter on democracy and governance, so I'm going to focus mainly on that and begin by simply echoing uh, what Secretary Car Carson said. 
governance, governance, governance. Now that said, uh, the challenge here is to really meld in with what I sense is already a, an articulated uh, policy by the Obama administration generally, and that is, first of all, to be pragmatic and to calibrate uh, the, the, uh, the initiatives to what is on the ground. You do not try to push down democratization in countries where conditions are not ripe. We have to make a strategic choice, I think, between democratic consolidation on the one hand and spreading democracy on the other. I opt for the first. And then you adopt uh, other pr uh, policies that are more in tune with the conditions in the particular countries. And a, a big challenge that we have, conflict has been ma mentioned on the one hand and democracy on the other. What do we do about these c countries in the gray zones, the semi-authoritarian states? Uh, the Ugandas, for example, uh, the Ethiopias. Uh, these uh, present enormous challenges. And one way we get out in front of the curve on this, to turn to the second part of uh, uh, Chet's question and to not play de defense, is to get ba back to basics in two respects. First of all, the rebuilding of the Africa Bureau itself. Uh, this is a bureau that has taken real hits in the last eight years, notwithstanding the prominence of Africa uh, by the Bush administration, the various initiatives that were articulated in, in the summary, the Africa Bureau itself needs to be uh, 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 rebu rebuilt. Uh, and likewise, USAID. Uh, USAID is a shadow of its former self, but there is good news. I was over at, the, uh, at USAID the other day at a forum on democracy and, and governance and learned that, first of all, uh, 350 uh, new officers are going to be hired in each of the next five years, 50 of them focusing on governance. So rebuilding a basic capacity here if you're going to implement these programs. And finally, in respect to aid, to turn to the issue of uh, food security. USAID used to run one of the flagship programs of the year, the world, in respect to ag agriculture. In aid itself, and in respect to the support for the consultative group of agricultural research uh, stations. It's a long-term project. It's whittled. It's to some extent been pushed aside by PEPFAR, and that is a real a conundrum that we face here because as good and as PEPFAR is, it has also to some extent taken us off of some key uh, uh, programs that we used to run and that were very effective and perhaps more than other, ever, particularly in this food security uh, area, uh, need to uh, uh, be readdressed. Thanks, Chet. Uh, I'm David Goldwyn. I wrote the energy chapter. Um, I have Saban. Uh, I think uh, I think the government is blessed to have Johnny Carson as uh, as assistant secretary because he's he's wise and he's going to be a terrific leader. But I guess after listening to him, I think um, uh, it's going to be hard for the non-crisis countries in Africa to get to the top of the U.S. foreign policy agenda because there are so many areas where uh, there is important concern like the Horn, like Somalia, like DRC, like Zimbabwe, like Kenya. We didn't hear Angola. We didn't hear Nigeria. We didn't hear a whole lot about West Africa. And I think the reality for Africa is still that some 80 percent of export revenues come from the extractive industry. Oil and gas are still going to matter to the economy, uh, and the countries that produce them don't get much diplomatic attention or are going to need to. I mean, I think the economic crisis provides a time of great opportunity because with prices are low, leakage or theft uh, becomes a lot more visible. Budgets are under enormous pressure in most of the producing countries. And so it is an opportunity to show those governments that are willing to engage that transparency can pay, efficiency can pay, productivity can pay. You can get a lot more of what you've got. You can get a lot more competition for what you're doing if you conduct your business in a more transparent way. And I think that's the path forward for U.S. engagement. I think when prices are low and there's not so much vibration about where the next barrel is coming from, it's a chance for the U.S. to have an energy security policy, to formulate what the approach is to the countries in Africa that produce. I think to take a new approach towards governance, which has been step one, building civil society, and that needs to continue. But step two is improving the quality of government to govern. And the fact is that finance ministries and energy ministries are pretty weak at the job they have to do. And the job they have to do is enormous and important. 
they don't know how to deal with a lot of the major companies. They can't do more than one deal at a time. So the U.S. government with USAID and others can engage in the MCC model with countries that are willing to engage, but I think in a different way to try and improve sector governance to work on, on maritime security. Um, and I think the trick will be that that will happen at the sub-cabinet. And it will happen with when the Africa Bureau partners with others, because I think it's going to be hard to get that to happen at the top. The real, um, the real unspoken question is what happens with the Niger Delta. It's not an area of great opportunity. The government is weak, not very easy to deal with, not much prospect of success, but impossible to avoid, too important to the entire continent, too important to the region, too important to the transnational issues. So I think the real question is going to be, is there an intelligent path forward? Can the U.S. make a difference? And then will there be enough of a consensus within the leadership to make an approach on the Niger Delta, uh, even if it has a low probability of success, but at least to put the U.S. on the map as saying this problem has gone as far as it should without external support, guidance, assistance, leadership, suggestion, pick a word that's acceptable to Nigeria, but it's enough to let Nigeria take care of it for itself. It's time to be helpful. And I think the question is, um, will that make the agenda? And I think that that chapter remains to be written. Princeton, you have a cleanup, and there's no one who has done more to keep Africa on the radar of this city and many other cities in this country over recent years than Princeton. So that's why I asked you to go last. And a lot of things have been said, Princeton, but you probably found one or two things that hadn't been. So A couple. A couple. Thank <laughs> you very much. And thanks uh, to the organization of CSIS for this whole project. Um, let me start off with something we haven't said today, which is that the United States is not in a position to solve Africa's problems. Uh, we're talking as if it's all in our hands. Uh, and that isn't true. Uh, not only that we don't have the capability, but much of this rests, 90 percent of it, in Africa and with Africa. And we've got to start there. I didn't hear any mention today of collaboration with other countries, either with our allies in Europe or with other countries. That's got to be part of our, our mindset, uh, as well as our collaboration with the Africans. In terms of how you keep Africa on the foreign policy agenda, of course, one way is the calamities and crisis, which is, of course, the worst way. But, you know, you get narco trafficking now, as well as the other things. Those are real crises, and they do lead people to think more seriously about Africa. But shifting that emphasis uh, is, is difficult. Uh, I want to pick up on Mark's point about Africa in the world. And there again, we need a strategy that brings together a lot of different elements of policy to address with Africa where they are in the world. Uh, we're not on the same page with Africa in the Doha round. We're probably not on the same page in climate change. Uh, and the question is, why is that the case? What, what is it that we haven't engaged in? We didn't hear anything today about trade. My friends from Manchester Trade who tutor me regularly on this issue would, would note that we haven't said anything about trade today. Now, I like initiatives like food security. I think agricultural development's been neglected for a long time, but I hope it's agricultural development and not food security, as if Africans only eat. Africans produce for the market. They produce industrial products. They have to move in that direction. Farmers need to sell, to buy shoes, et cetera. And it goes to a lot of complicated issues. John mentioned land, et cetera. Now, what I worry about an uh, initiative like that, I hear David talking about the food security issue in the greater horn of Africa, and it sort of dissipated. A few years, about three years ago, I read a report of the International Food Policy Research Institute on how, what are the problems in agricultural development in Africa. Looked at it, and something was very familiar about it. And I realized when I was in AID in 1976, we said the same things. So. <laughs> The question is, can we start an initiative of this kind and maintain it long enough with enough resources, with enough cooperation, 10 years, 15 years, uh, to have a real impact? Or will it dissipate because somebody comes up with another initiative or a competing initiative uh, that gets in the way? That's the real uh, challenge in taking on something like that. Finally, it has to link to governance. 
You can't tackle agricultural development without getting at problems of governance. Who controls the grain reserves? Who sells them on the side? Who controls marketing? Who controls land tenure? Um, um, so you can't separate that from the governance issue. Uh, so it, it seems to me that, that for Africa policy, uh, all these initiatives and ideas are good, but they have to be brought together in a, in a more comprehensive way that deals with Africa on the global scene and packages our trade and development elements together in that kind of a strategy. It needs to say, how do you deal with governance? What are you going to say to countries that govern badly? but you want to help on agricultural development. I think we have to be fairly clear on that. Um, one, two more other comments. Johnny didn't say today what he said on other occasions, which is it's imp the, the key states emphasis, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa. But then up pops Guinea-Bissau, and that's one of the lessons of Africa. Uh, you, it, you'd love to concentrate on the big and important countries, but it's the little ones that often bite you in the ankle. And that's just one of the management <laughs> issues, one of the great problems and one of the great tasks of, of and why you need a bureau that is built and strengthened enough to deal with that. Uh, the final thing is, where is the initiative? Where is the signature initiative of this administration? If you look at the 2010 uh, budget request, uh, it's like a holding place. It put more for MCC, more for PEPFAR, more for USAID, et cetera. It's all the Bush initiatives, and let's keep them going, which is fine. But you say, well, where's Obama's legacy? What's, what's going to stand out? And it seems to me what ought to stand out, and the script to Ghana is the perfect opportunity, is to say, you know, it's nothing is going to work unless we see responsible, good leadership in Africa. And I'm pushing that at home. I'm telling the governors they've got to sell, spend the stimulus money responsibly. I'm saying that to families in the United States, and now I'm saying it to you. And he's got the credibility to do it, and then he packages programs accordingly. Going to Ghana sent that message. It, there are a lot of countries just gnashing their teeth over the fact that he picked Ghana. And, but it hasn't come out yet. It hasn't been the signature emphasis that Obama says, this, this is what I'm going to do for eight years. I'm going to encourage good leaders. I'm going to inspire people in Africa to take up the cudgels of good governance. That's going to be my signature emphasis. And all these other programs come in behind it. Thank you very much to all of the panel. I, I don't know if the wine has run out yet, but I think we probably have time for maybe five or ten minutes of, of questions, which we would probably do and then uh, see which panelists might want to respond. As I listened to this uh, very, very good set of presentations, I heard some common themes that emerged. Um, obviously, governance did. The problem of focusing on big relationships came out of the discussion. But so did the problem of the Mauritanias and the Guinea-Bissau's. No offense to anybody. <laughs> uh, the, the issue of prevention came out in all the different uh, commentaries that were made, the, the importance of, of, of thinking uh, uh, ahead of the crisis rather than waiting, waiting for the crisis. Uh, capacity building right here at home, vitally important. Mainstreaming Africa, burden sharing, and not pretending that somehow Africa's uh, future is in American hands. Uh, and then finally, uh, a theme that was mentioned briefly, which I think needs a little more attention, is the whole issue of private sector engagement. Because the private sector in Africa is a very exciting story, and there are people here in this room who know it uh, far better than I. Are there any microphones around for those who might have a question or two? If so, raise your hand and we will get a microphone. And we'll take th two or three questions and then we'll go back to the panel. So, now, right here. Go ahead. Hi. Paul Mutter, Bridging Nations. You had mentioned that Obama's first visit was to Ghana. In the past few years, the People's Republic of China leadership has made a lot of high-profile visits in that region and to other parts of Africa. So all of you had talked about the potentials for economic development and to bringing Africa into global dialogue with other countries, specifically the new energy policies of countries like China. So my question is, 
in terms of energy policy and also governance, where do you see the possibility for cooperation with the People's Republic of China, and where do you see our interests being at odds, and there needs to be more dialogue with China and with specific African countries? Yes. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, capacity building in the United States. Uh, I was wondering what your thoughts were on capacity building efforts in Africa, um, particularly with respect to trade capacity, um, fin strengthening financial institutions. Um, and I also wondered, as a follow-up, what uh, initiatives you feel have been most helpful in that regard. Thanks. have to. So, Steve. Steve Lamy, I shouldn't say this in public, but Chet Cracker and I graduated from John Hopkins together with uh, Kendall, Walter Kendall, who just, got, who just got his name in the newspaper for being a Cuban spy. But, <laughs> Walter Kendall Miles, I forgot his last name, but, but seriously, a quick comment. We very much appreciate <laughs> All I know is I bought his house, so they're going to check it out. But seriously, uh, Princeton, we very much appreciate your comment about Manchester trade tutoring. You tutored us in Africa, but I do believe that the best thing that can happen, if anybody who knows Africa won tutoring on trade, please come to Tony Cowell and I in Manchester trade. Because the one thing that hasn't been mentioned and absolutely blows my mind because it's an African initiative is the steps that are being taken for regional integration. Regional integration, there's no way 48 countries can develop. Regional integration now is so close, it can be an Obama success. In East Africa, there are three regional economic communities, Kamesi, East African community, and SADC. They now have a tripod group. In West Africa, Nigeria is what we say, is two tariff concessions away from joining the French-speaking countries in ECOWAS. One of the things that are missing is a U.S. approach. What Princeton does in his book, and it deserves compliments, is he says, you know, the U.S. doesn't support regional integration because in Africa, because when we go to the WTO, we don't say, oh, there are some WTO rules that actually make regional integration harder to achieve. The European unions are trying to screw things up with their little mercantilist economic partnership agreements. So the way I would simply stop and say, because you can't go on in this, and so on. But the way I would simply stop is say, I would hope we give some attention to having another initiative along with food security and the other ones mentioned that really focuses on how we can help really promote economic integration, a very possible accomplishment during the eight years of President Obama's administration. I don't have to teach you guys anything. It's great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, the panel, who would like to pick up on some of these questions? The floor is open. Let, let me address the, the issue of uh, China-U.S. Uh, cooperation in Africa. I wrote the, the section in the book on that. And if for those of you who haven't yet seen the book, and if you have an interest in that particular topic, about half of what I wrote is actually recommendations for how U.S. and China cooperate. So I won't regurgitate all of those for you. They're, they're easily read. I would simply note that the, uh, the Chinese effort in Africa in recent years has been absolutely astounding. Uh, it, um, it has quite frankly, at, some, at many levels, surpassed that of the U.S. effort in Africa. And in some countries, uh, at least a half a dozen, maybe up to a dozen, I would argue today that Chinese influence is greater than American influence. Now, admittedly, some of these are countries like Guinea-Bissau that maybe we don't want to have that much influence in, uh, but some of them are not, and, and they're not all the pariahs. I mean, Sudan and Zimbabwe certainly fall in this category, but there are other countries where clearly the Chinese have equaled or surpassed U.S. influence, and I would say they're gaining ground rather than losing ground. Um, on the issue of, of regional integration, there's a Chinese element there, too. The Chinese are beginning to take this seriously. They are dealing with not only the ECOWASs and the SADACs of the world, but with the South African Customs Union and the COMESAs of the world. They, they, they've got it. They understand it. Uh, the, the Chinese uh, were the ones who hosted the African Development Bank meeting in Shanghai in 2007. Uh, they get it. Uh, we haven't quite gotten it yet in some respects. There, as I say, there are a lot of areas where, there's, where we could cooperate with China in Africa, but rather than my regurgitate them, read them in the book. 
Yeah, I think uh, just on the uh, the energy side, I think there's a tremendous opportunity for cooperation with China because we really have the same interest in stable prices, security of supply, an international market they have access to. I think China has learned that the oil for infrastructure deals were a mistake. None of them actually produced a transaction. They produced a huge backlash for the foreign ministry. Now they're trying to buy supply in the open market. So I think there's a lot of potential there. We have to talk to them about their need, which is energy security, and not not just about what's problematic. In terms of standards, they have a different view, and on EITI in particular. They don't buy it. They don't buy our development model, didn't think it worked, think theirs deserves a try. But because their own policy is changing, I think there is a chance to have uh, a conversation about, about the politics and about stability in the region, and I think we haven't actually had that dialogue on that subject yet. It's all been about climate and other things, so I think there's, there's an opportunity to, to, forge some, uh, to forge some cooperation there. Just, I just say one more thing in respect to China and the, and the governance dimension, and in, in that is the the official line is this one of mutual respect, and we're not pushing democracy, and you people are, meaning the the U.S. And it appears like a divide, but the the, the counter is, and again, to pick up on, on David's point, and the opportunity for cooperation is that many of their deals are not they're not going to be sustainable unless there is uh, viable states and good governance in in. Uh, in this region. So if we segue slightly off of the democratization dimension of, of, uh, of uh, governance when dealing specifically with the, uh, the Chinese but emphasize state capacity, rule of law in particular, uh, then there may be common ground here where uh, our mutual in interests are advanced. Just, just a quick word on the, this question of uh, regional integration. I'm, I'm not a trade expert, but, but it occurs to me that we, we have no reason certainly to oppose regional integration and no reason not to work to remove obstacles if they exist within the WTO. Um, but just as with other forms of regional integration, whether it's trade or whether it's security assistance, I mean, the impetus really has to come from the Africans themselves. There really has to be a determination that they want these things to happen. We cannot substitute our enthusiasm for greater regional cooperation for, you know, to compensate for, for, for maybe ambivalence or reluctance on the part of African states. And I think part of the problem we're seeing is not so much the external obstacles, but it's also the ambivalence on the part of certain governments um, and, and a little bit of uncertainty in that regard. Well, thank you all. You've been a great audience. Please join me in thanking our panel.